Come, Come on, on, pretty girl. <laughs> Come yeah. on and help me sponge John Holiday live earrings. Come on now. <laughs> yes. All right. I'm going to share. The, um, hey, everybody. Hi. Yes. I'm going to share to my to the, my fan page. And here I am. I need to hide. Hey. Yes. We'll get ready. Yes, we are live. We are compete. I'm competing with my own self, John Holiday. Oh, come on now. Because that's the that's the thing, right? You don't want any competition except for yourself. That's exactly. right. Exactly. Well, because I, they are streaming the Philly Orchestra. Oh. The concert that I did um in Philly in, with the Philly Orchestra tonight. Okay. They're streaming it. And I was like, oops. She's, on, she's uh doing kiki conversations with John Holiday. Don't try it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, so hopefully everybody comes after the show. Mm -hmm. They will. They'll come oh, and see it. Yeah, hey, 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 Patrice Eaton. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, so you can see all that. Yeah, um, you'll be able to see it when you share. Ah, okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. I got it now. Yes. Adam and Kenny and Demontra, yes, Mr. Cole. All right. Good morning in the room, everybody. I think I shared it. Okay. Awesome sauce. Here we go. We're Here we ready. Go. We are ready. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. How's everybody tonight? Hey, 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 Mark Markham. Yes. There it is. I see it now. You there we go. Now. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Yes, Marty, my best friend is we are here for you. Yes, ma'am. Hey, John Christopher. <laughs> yes, hi. Hey, Alan. Oh. Come on, family. Yes. Yes. How's your day today, John Holiday? I have had a busy day, Would you but do? I am here. I had to teach today, so I was doing some teaching mm -hmm. and met with met with a dear friend um, who's great at doing strategizing, so I was working on doing some of that this morning. Excellent. And then had a little assessment that I needed to do, like, later on this afternoon. I did that, uh, and then spoke with some family, and then I got a brother that keeps on calling uh, I'm I'm keeping it PG. Yeah, I keep it PG, Adam. I promise. Yes, good. Well, um, it's PG thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, but I am. Yeah, I was busy, but you know that's that's good. You know, I can't mm -hmm. complain. I'm 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 happy. Good. You know, today today's a, today is a good day. You yeah. know, it's one of those days that you you can choose to. Um, to stay where you are, or you can pick yourself up by the bootstraps or yes. whatever you have. You don't have bootstraps, you know, by whatever. Yeah. And keep on going. Yes. Know, so. Yes. Mm. Mm, yeah. It is, it's, your day. it's like that. But we're going to say hi to a few more people. Um, yeah. Eve Giliotti, please say a prayer for Eve and her family. I love you too, Eve. You couldn't stay away. <laughs> Oh, Holly Harrison. Yes, Alan Savada. Cameo. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole, for Color Girls. You, yeah. Who wants PG? Exactly. Uh, you know, that was my first introduction to you, was uh, for Color Girls. Yeah, really? Well, uh, yes. I was like, I want to see, I want to be in a movie like that. <laughs> 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 Listen. Oh. I'm ready for the next one, okay? I'm gonna be yes. in a movie too. Yes, I keep telling Terrence Blanchard, um, when you're making all these film scores, uh, you know your girl wants to be in the movies again. Come on now, <laughs> come on, come on. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. What are we drinking tonight, Mr. Holiday? I am drinking some champagne Perrier Jouet Grand Bru. Nice. I'm that. That's what I'm. That's what I'm doing right now. So I'm trying to, you know. I do it slow. Yeah, I know that's right. I, it's either this or vodka. And I thought I, I've had enough vodka this week. I'll do a little champagne today. 
Champagne. It, I, I'm with that. I'm drinking some Pinar, Pinot, yeah. Pinot Noir Rosé. Cheers, 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 ching, ching, ching. Mm. Yeah. All right. So I, when I, I first heard about you through the grapevine, of course, mm -hmm. and through some of your uh, recordings, because you've done a lot of competitions and, you know, and uh, anything. We'll talk about all of that. But I, but where I fell in love with you, you know, was was when you guys did. Um, we should not be moved. Oh, and I was like, first of all, what in the whole? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you know, it's. I just, I just thought that 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 thing right there is oh. just from God. Just the whole thing. And I've gotten to like know you better, and mm -hmm. over time, and just to see your light shine, and I just, you just are warmth, and light, and love, and honesty, mm -hmm. and truth, and your gift is just immense, and so I'm Thank such you. a, like, a fan of yours, like, we're friends, but I'm, like, a real fan, you know? Thank you. That means I'm a lot to me. It really, it really does, and, and I, don't, I don't just say that, I mean, it really does mean a lot to me, um, because you know when you work really, you understand it. So what, what I'm saying is not yeah. profound. But when you work really hard and you really honed in on your craft, uh, and coming from the background that I come from, I, I definitely raised missionary Baptist. Okay. So like just keeping on believing in God, giving me a gift for a reason to share it, mm -hmm. and uh, knowing that that gift is meant to be shared with everybody that I know and not kept for myself. So when anybody enjoys it and they love it and they love what I'm doing, that means so much to me because I know that it's not me that's doing the singing. I know that it's God sending his angels to sing through me. Yeah. Uh, and that's always my prayer. So I'm happy. And I'm so happy to make you proud. That's what I want to do. I want to make you proud. I want to yes. make every one of you proud. All my people. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly are doing that. And I, I just wanted you to talk about how you started, you mm -hmm. know, um, where you're from and just share, share that. And I'm not crying y'all. I'm just all of a sudden my eye just all right. wanted to run. It out. Okay, <laughs> listen, I'm not, that is sitting right here and it wants to come up and I'm like, not yet. I can't, I got stuff to do. I got stuff to do. I'm not even trying to be bothered. Oh with that. no, <laughs> um, no, I started out, um, I, was around i mean i my my family says they they said i've been singing since i was 2 years old so mm -hmm. my grandmother and my mother uh would put me on top of the, the pianos or top of tables and i would sing so mm -hmm. i've always sung mm -hmm. since i was little bitty in fact i remember some of that not all of it but i've i've, I've always sung uh, I am from, I was born in Houston, Texas, so I am an H-Town boy, <laughs> but was raised in a, a city, a suburb of Houston called Rosenberg, Texas. When I was growing up, it was considered the country, but it is not the country. It never was the country, but it definitely was a little bit away from the center of Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, but I matriculated through those schools out there, and uh, when I was in school, I was in like TMEA Allstate. I was the first chair of Texas doing that. Mm. And I had been singing for a long time. I was also at my school. I was, in fact, the first black drum major of our school in, oh. um, in Rosenberg wow. and was also in, uh, in choir at the same time. Like I said, went on and did TMEA Allstate and UIL and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then I went to college at Southern Methodist University, where I studied with Barbara Hill Moore, who is one of the most phenomenal teachers in the United States, in the world. And I was lucky to have her. And she happens to be a black woman. So I was proud to study with her and learn so much from her and see her doing her thing. Uh, and uh, it was in my sophomore year, like the end of my freshman year, going into my sophomore year, that I, I had gone to see my very first opera that I, like ever, uh, I went to go and see Rigoletto mm -hmm. at Ford Opera. And Indira Mahajan, I think is her name, she was singing Gilda. Yes. And firstly, never seen like a black woman singing in opera, other than seeing when I was very young, I was in the Forbin Boys Choir and I had seen Denise Grave singing. Mm -hmm. And when I saw her singing, I thought to myself, Ooh, <laughs> oh my Lord, I wanna, I wanna do what Mrs. Graves is doing. Yes, of and course. And she, she is the inspiration behind my singing opera because I saw her do it, that's why I do it. But then, because uh, she was singing um, Marguerite in Faust, but not the, not the opera. 
Yes, um, yes the damnation of the, the damnation of Faust. Mm -hmm. So, and I was the boy soloist um, in from the from the choir singing the solo. So that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But anyway, fast forward to my 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 freshman year of college, singing uh, Indira Mahajan singing uh, Jilda. I went to see that. And I fell in love with Karonome. I remember going to research it. And I told Prop, I, I called uh, Barbie Hill more Prop. I said, Prop, I can sing really, really high. Uh, and she's like, no, you can't. I was like, oh, I promise you, I really can. And she said, well, let me hear something. So all I knew at that moment to sing up high was like Karonome. So I sang Karonome for her. And she's like, oh, you are a countertenor. That's what that's called. And so ever since the ending of my freshman year, going into my sophomore year, I've been a countertenor. Yes. Uh, and I've always sung on the higher side uh, uh, of repertoire. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also sing the low, low things as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, this little uh, little country boy from Rosenberg, Texas, and singing all over the world. Then, of course, going from SMU to CCM, where I studied with Karen Likes. Um, and then going from uh, CCM to the Juilliard School. I did do a brief stint at the um, Jacobs School of Music at IU where I studied with Marietta Simpson for a year. But I left IU and I went uh, back and I taught high school and junior high school for a year. Then I went to CCM and uh -huh. then the Juilliard School. Wonderful. Well, that's a long story. <laughs> that's No, it's not. It's good. That's what we're here for, for people to get to know you. Mm -hmm. um, who were your teachers at Juilliard? My teachers at Juilliard, I still study with Marlena Malice. So I study with her primary for voice. Yes. Uh, and, but you know what I have to say? Like, I, I see all of my teachers wherever I am. If I'm in Dallas or somewhere in Texas and I can get to prop, because that's my first, she's like my mother. Yeah. So I will go, they all like my mom, really. Mm -hmm. I'll go see her. If I'm close, because I live in uh, Wisconsin, so every now and then I'll go to, uh, to Cincinnati uh, and see Karen Likes, because she is amazing. She is Fucking amazing. Sorry, y'all, but she no, is. No, no, no. So I studied with her. Uh, but at Juilliard, I uh, studied with studied with Mar Marlena Malice and coached with Cordina Caporello and Diane Richardson, who yes. is a god. These are all goddesses. Stephen Wadsworth, who I credit with making me a better actor uh, and being more um, aware of just who I am and what I have to offer my body and being free. Um, who else did I coach with there? I mean, I coached with so many people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what I think Juilliard was really good at doing, giving, I mean, you had coachings like every day. Sometimes I just wouldn't go. I'm like, I'm not going today. I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm not going to school today. It's all, it's yes. done. Yeah, yeah, Marlena was my teacher for two years at Curtis, my mm -hmm. first two years. Mm -hmm. I love I love her. She's yeah. a dear heart. And I, uh, in fact, I talked to her last week. So she's, uh, she's just, uh, uh, she just is right here with me. Like I, mm -hmm. I, I love her to death. So please give her my best. She is. I will. She is fighting and scratching and fighting. She is. You don't count her out, y'all. No, not at all. I don't care what happens. Don't count Marlena out. She's not gonna enough. come back up. She exactly. is. Exactly. That's for sure. Yes. That's for sure. So talk to um the people about your voice type because there's always this mystique around the countertenor, right? It was, yeah. it, it became like a thing and then everybody was a countertenor at one point. Yeah. Um, uh, I have actually a baritone that's like, you think I should sing countertenor because he's got a nice uh, mm -hmm. head, you know, a, a falsetto. Mm -hmm. But speak to people about what exactly it means to be a countertenor. A countertenor basically, especially if you don't know what that is, basically a countertenor is a male alto or a male mezzo, male soprano, mm -hmm. kind of ranges. And I think in the last 20 years, what we're what we're discovering is just as multifaceted as any voice type. Uh, and I, I think before people liked to put us in a box, like, well, if you're kind of tender, you only sing like this. Mm -hmm. Or if you sing really high, you're a sopranist. There are certainly some of the, some people out there who are doing that. Uh, but yeah, the voice type is uh, predominantly. Uh, um, used in Baroque music, which is from the 1600s to 1750-ish mm -hmm. um, time period. So lots of Mozart, Handel, Bach, Monteverdi, yes. all these wonderful composers. More than that, I can't just tell you off the top of my head, of but course, these are kind of of the main six, Handel, I, I probably already said that. Mm -hmm. um, but we typically specialize in that music, which is lots of ornamentations and trills and all that wonderful, I like to call it jazz, all those blue notes. Yeah. And so for me, it's a lot of fun to do it because I grew up in the church mm -hmm. and grew up playing the piano in church and playing the organ in church. So a lot of ornamentations, people hate when I say this, but for me, 
when I'm doing ornamentations, I'm thinking about what I hear and it kind of harkens for me back to my roots in church. Uh -huh. So I utilize a lot of that. I only, I can only utilize what I know. Uh, and while these treatises are out there and all these wonderful things are out there that exist, that's a lot of information. Not saying that you shouldn't read it, but sometimes when you read a lot of things, it can lock you up. Right. Um, and so what I do is I read it, I take it, and I digest it, and I utilize what's best for me, and I keep on going. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's a counter tenor. It's basically just just a, a male soprano. And if you if you're thinking about if you're thinking about popular music, Smokey Robinson, mm -hmm. Frankie Lyman, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Frankie Valley, yes. you know, all these people. Uh, I even think like Tevin Campbell, you know, yes. Jackson. I mean, yes. all these people, uh, for me, that's my, my reference point in the popular music world. Uh, and definitely in church, growing up in church, I heard so much of it, uh, of, of black male singers singing high that I didn't, I didn't know anything of it. In fact, I remember when I was in boys choir, like when uh, I was in boys choir, I got asked to move to the soprano two section, so like the middle, and I was being mad. I was like, well, I can still sing high though. He's like, but it's not because you can't sing high, because I need your voice in the strong part of the section. I was like, all right. Yes. But I've, but I've all, always heard of, uh, of that. And so what I try to tell people now, when you hear a, a male singing up there high, or someone who, is, uh, let's, instead of saying, male let's say non treble uh non or well, treble treble voices if you hear a treble voice singing up high uh -huh. then just know that it's something that's not weird it's just this person singing in their in their regular voice mm -hmm. and what i would say to your baritone if he wants to sing up there is that if it is comfortable to him then give it a try but if it's something that is that presenting a lot of discomfort mm -hmm. try it for a little bit and if it ain't getting any better then maybe you should keep on doing the the baritone thing because you really want to make sure that whatever you're doing there is ease and freedom in the in the voice and the body and absolutely. that the tone just spins absolutely okay. absolutely we got some josh Winnegray. hey josh hey josh hey, mel moore hi mel just want to say hi to some people Melody. there's some storms in dc you guys got our storms from last night so brandon behave thank you um <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yes, Nicole Heaston, yes. Yeah. So when I hear you and I see you do your concerts, you know, you, you play for yourself, play piano, and uh, just speak a little bit about the importance and what it does for you, for you as a, as a music, as a singer, how freeing it is to be able to accompany yourself because, you know, back in the day, I really should be a, a prolific pianist, <laughs> but she used to cut her piano lessons Okay. To hang out with her now husband, back then boyfriend. Well, they did pay off, though. See, it did pay off. <laughs> That's what people off. say. It paid off. Yeah. But she's not very good at piano. So just That's talk a little right. bit about to, to some of the, the ones that are coming up. <laughs> um, I think it's so important to hone in on your piano skills. I, I, I will tell people from the get-go, I am a self-taught pianist. And I really, mm -hmm. I am not lying when I say that. Uh, I had one piano lesson in my entire life before I got to college. And then when I was in college, of course, you know, they make you, they make you take piano classes. But if you're watching me, sometimes you'll notice I use the wrong fingers, but I can play. I can play just about anything. Mm -hmm. I'm using the wrong fingering to play. Uh -huh. but I can play all of the music generally if you get if you let me sit with it for like a day or two if it's something that's really difficult i'll get it eventually uh -huh. uh, but i think it's really important to hone in on the piano skills whether you're using the right fingers or not mm -hmm. if they're your fingers they can't be too wrong as long yeah. as they're yours they're right they're right um but what what i have um been able to do because of my ability to play the piano is that i can really play through anything and I can kind of, I, I will go through the entire score and play the entire score before I go to a coach. Mm -hmm. um, so then once I'm going to a coach, I am being coached stylistically on things, but most of the time it's re just repetition, so a repetiteur, mm -hmm. going through it over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my dear friends, he is who I always go to, Kevin Miller, and I think he's mm -hmm. watching, so I always go to Kevin, that is my okay. boy. He's one of the people I talked about everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and even one of my coaching friends that's here, uh, Andrew Crooks. But Kevin Miller is amazing, and, and more people should know who he is. Yes, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a real talent and a phenomenal human being. Mm -hmm. But I, I will coach with him, 
But I, I think it's so important to learn how to play so you can do some things for yourself and not be so dependent on other people because mm -hmm. you really can learn so much from playing through uh, playing through a tour. Yeah, and it's really important for me to just to just be who I am 150%. Like what you guys see on those recordings, I hope you can see or the live videos is uh, that you can see me being my full authentic self. The day that I did the recital, uh, I forgot now for whom the recital was Opera for. Philly. Opera, Opera Philly. Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. On that day, I was actually planning to just stand and sing. You know, I had uh, Kevin to record things and I mm -hmm. couldn't get it to work. At the last minute, I kid you not, probably like an hour or two, maybe and a half, hour and a half before, I was like, okay, holiday, come up with a plan. Like, you sit down and play. And so I just played for myself. Um, and it is freeing. I don't have to practice it too much because I, by now I can kind of go through things. Sometimes I do. Uh, but I'll go, go through it and make sure I can play most of it. Uh, and being able to play um, the jazz and the gospel is important to me because that's, as Leontine would say, my roots. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not ashamed of that. Uh, growing up, I was the church musician. I don't play like a lot of uh, this is so funny because I'm just like my grandmother. My grandmother used to play, and when she would hear me play, she would say, I can't play like that. So what I'm going to say is, I, I can't play like everybody else, uh -huh. but I can play. I can get us through. Uh, and it's just important to be, to utilize every single gift that God has given me so that I can uplift him and, and bring some joy and some, uh, some pleasure for if it's just 30 minutes of the day to people's lives. Yes, yes. So, yeah. Well, I know you've created your own shows and you tour in between your opera gigs. So yes. I want you to talk about um, creating your own opportunities because, and I oftentimes ask sing certain singers that, and you know, we don't learn those things in school. We don't learn how to like, build a show yeah. and how to market a show and, and production, you know, as, as, yeah. as vocal performance majors and opera people, opera majors, we don't, we don't learn that. So talk a little bit about how, where, when, how, why, like all of those yeah. things. I started uh, my show called the holiday experience with my best friend, Nikai. We were in Dallas and I was like, you know, I want to do this show. And Nikai's like, you should do it. And we're going to do it in the house. So when we first started it, I believe we started it in 2013 or 2012. I cannot remember the year now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I should. That's a shame Shame for me to not remember. But um, <laughs> we started it, and it was in his house. And it stemmed from me and my desire, as I was saying earlier, to like present the whole picture of who John Holiday is. I didn't want people to see and hear me and think of me in just one way, especially when I grew up how I grew up. I mean, I grew up singing gospel music in the church choir and hearing, you know, uh, Johnny Mathis and all these people singing on the weekends with my grandmother and my aunt, you know, when they're playing cards. So, yeah. you know, these last two dollars and, you know, me yeah. and Mrs. Jones and, I mean, all this stuff, you know, Ella Fitzgerald mm -hmm. and all these wonderful Nina, Nina Simone, Sarah Vaughn, you know, Nancy Wilson. I mean, all these people that you would hear growing up, or at least I would hear. And so I wanted to be able to incorporate that into my into my recitals or into my singing. Yeah. And there was also another reason, the major reason behind that, because I talk really fast when I get excited, so just tell me to slow down. It's, it's okay, get excited, um, that's what we're here for. Is that, you know, coming from a, a, a community of African-American people and from communities of color, growing up, we rarely hear opera, right? Mm -hmm. We rarely hear a lot of classical music, unless you are, you know, going out down a different path and you're in choir, you, mm -hmm. you will hear it. But most likely you don't grow up with it, you know? Mm -hmm. We're not all a monolith, but generally it's not something that you hear all the time right, at, right, at home. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for me, what I was wanting, because I kept on hearing when I was very young, and it goes to show you, because at this point, I really wasn't singing a whole, whole lot at a lot of places. I had just kind of started in 2011 with my professional career. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought, if everybody's talking about bringing more African-American people into the audience and more people of color into the audience, there has to be a bridge. And so what I thought is, I was like, well, I know that if I do a recital where I do some classical things, and then I also sing some jazz and I also sing some gospel. Mm -hmm. It'll bring more people into, into the sphere of, of opera because to me, gospel is not far from jazz right. and jazz 
that is not far from classical music. Mm -hmm. And if I bridge that gap, then it may make more, it, it may, uh, it may give people the on-ramp into opera, and it'll also give the fans of mine who love opera an on-ramp into jazz because there is not necessarily a, a correlation. They may not like jazz. Right. So, and, and I also want my classical audience to know, hey, I can do this thing over here too, and it's not a party trick. Like, right. this, is, this is for real. Mm -hmm. um, and it came from also to tell you, um, not seeing what I wanted to see. If that makes any sense, it I was like, I don't see, <laughs> I don't see what I want to see, and I'm not being in, I'm not getting cast in a lot of these things. But there's a thing that I can do, so I'm gonna do my own show. I'm gonna produce my own show and do it my way, yeah. where nobody can tell me what to do, and I'm gonna do what I want. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I started doing that, and it really has taken off um, because, pardon me, mm -hmm. I do have a lot of fun when I'm on stage singing, singing, you know, the arias or art songs mm, yes. or chanson, whatever, and then mixing it with Round Midnight or Misty or whatever. Because yes. um, I think that's important to do. So that's kind of how it started. And, and then in this last two years, I really started taking it on tour and doing more with it. You know, yes. Like Apollo in Los Angeles. That's amazing. The yeah. Apollo, I mean, come on. That's incredible. Yeah, that's yeah. work in our community. And and you I'm know I'm telling you, that's where I met Jamie Foxx. Like he came into my yes. like, I was doing my sound check mm -hmm. and up the skits. I was telling Kevin and I were finishing up H. Leslie Adams' um The Heart of a Woman. Uh-huh. And and uh there walks in this entourage. And I was like, Who is this? And I had on different glasses. I had on my blue glasses that I had on before I started the uh, yes. conversation. And I was like, Kevin, I was like, I think that's Jamie. But let's just act normal. Let's just act normal. And of course, Kevin's like, all right, you know, he ain't bothered at all. At all. But I'm sitting there freaking out. And then afterwards, like, Jamie Foxx goes into this roarous, you know, this applause, like, and then comes and talks to me. And so much so that uh, that Dwight, who who was running things at the, uh, Apollo's, like, okay, like, I know you love Jamie and he loves you, but we need you mm -hmm. to be quiet because you got to sing this recital. Yes. Um, but yeah, that was, that was an experience. That oh. was an experience. And how... I cannot begin to tell you how honored I am to have sung there uh, and to have done a recital there. I don't know that that's been done before. I don't know. It might have, but just Does to somebody step know that? in there yes. and, and to do that recital and to bring, because let me tell you, I am proud of Black history. And before I knew of a Met or before I knew of a Carnegie Hall, before I knew of a Chicago Lyric or a Los Angeles Opera, I knew of an Apollo. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so to step onto that stage and to sing, I was honored and still feel honored and blessed. Absolutely. It's a once in a lifetime experience. Oh, yes. Is the stage yes. as big as it, well, it looks kind of small compared to what we're used to, but. It is smaller than you would think. I think because when, you, when you're watching it on TV, it seems so big. I mean, and especially for me, like growing up a Showtime at the Apollo, I mean, it looked so big. But being on it, it's, it's you know what's interesting? It's just another stage. Just another and stage. it's a place where I love what Oprah has said. You know, what I know for sure is that God has never brought me to a place where I wasn't supposed to be. Mm. So when I step onto the stage, I just... I remember, um, you know, Adam is on here. There was a moment when we were at the Apollo and I asked the cast, I said, I know this is crazy. I said, but could you just with me lie down on the floor and just turn your ear to the floor? Mm. And I mean, I have chills right now thinking of that. And what that symbolized to me was paying homage to those who have come before me and also listening to the history and listening to the sounds and the voices. And and, and and letting them say welcome. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the Apollo. Yes. It was oh, amazing. That is amazing. That is amazing. I mean, our whole entire history as African Americans, not the entire, but a large percentage is there. I mean, it's yes. like being an opera singer and sitting yes. in your dressing room at the Metropolitan or at Carnegie Hall or La Scala, wherever the big, you know, the meccas of opera, and you're like, yeah, it's like you just take the moment to breathe that in, and the place like the Apollo, historic, you know, places for our culture, you just breathe that in and take that moment. 
I hope yeah. I hope I hope we all do that all the time. I hope so. Yes. Hope so. As people are saying hi, Naguanda Noble. She's another one that does the cross genre. Come on, Naguanda. I don't know her, but I would love to know. Her. Oh, you have to know her. That voice, my God. That top is stupid. Okay. <laughs> I'm I'm like, hi, Naguanda. Naguanda, Jennifer. Hey. Hi, Jen. Jen said she uh, Yes, you must offer a great variety and recital. Yeah. So talk about when you, you know, when you went to your 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 management and said, "Hey, I want to do these other things." Were they receptive? Because you know, oftentimes, and I'm sorry, I apologize to the opera managers. You know, they don't really, they're not always flexible in that way. Yeah. You know, now we have to. I mean, it's amazing that you created your own show because you'll be able to go back on the road and make your income much faster yeah. than them mounting a handle or Vivaldi or Gluck yes. opera. You know what I mean? So did you yes. have a lot of pushback with your management and your agents? There was never pushback, back, but with my original management, I'm not, I'm no longer with my, my very first manager that I had mm -hmm. in my career. I've moved on since then. Uh, with my first manager, he was a, a fantastic human being. But I don't think that there was an understanding of that side of me because that was something that he didn't understand, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Like that is mm -hmm. all right. With my current management, uh, Alex Fletcher, who I'm with right now, Fletcher Arts. Alex is on here. I, I think he's on there. I adore mm -hmm. Alex, and um, and he is really supportive of it, and he's understanding because he knows it's a part of who I am. Yes. Uh, you know, he has heard me in 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 concert singing. Uh, whether it be, you know, live through, you know, the virtual recital or singing mm -hmm. or memorial services mm -hmm. or whatever, he's been there to hear that. So he, understand it. Uh, he understands it. Yeah. I do think that there is a learning curve for any manager that is that is uh, predominantly doing classical music. And there's a learning curve for me as well because in, in essence, what's happening when you start to cross over or you're doing crossover things, mm -hmm. where I have established a career in the uh, classical idiom, in that career, I'm starting kind of over and mm -hmm. growing and learning. So you kind of start from the bottom again mm -hmm. and then go back up. Absolutely. So there is learning, you know. Which is a lot when you've established, I mean, to cut you off, but it was a lot when you establish yourself to think, yeah. oh, shoot, I yeah. got to start all over again. <laughs> yeah. No, but you know what? If you have faith in what you do, mm -hmm. It is sometimes a difficult, uh, it's a difficult choice to yes. make because everything is about a choice, right? Mm -hmm. You can choose to stay someplace that's comfortable or you can stretch, as Maya Angelou says, just stretch yourself. Yes. You stretch yourself <laughs> and you do and you do that. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it definitely uh, was a journey uh, mm -hmm. when, when you go back down and start going back up, but you start to learn those structures and some things don't sell well, some things do sell well yes. when you're first starting out. Uh, because it, like I said, it's a different market. But I, I have had a wonderful uh, journey with Alex and him being so supportive and understanding and telling me to do it. He's mm -hmm. like, absolutely you do it. Mm -hmm. Not that my prior manager, uh, manager said that I shouldn't. He just didn't understand it as well, and that's neither here nor there. Right. Uh, it, right. it is what it is, and I, I adore him and think he's, like I said, I think he's a great human being. But Alex has been fantastic with uh, with making things, how can I say this, making it be what I want it to be. Right. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So talk about, okay, we talked about your voice type and talk about, you know, singing opera in the genres. Talk to me about what it, what your experience is as a Black man in this industry and a black man who sings male soprano repertoire. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a whole other, you know, my dear friend, rest in peace, Matthew Truss. Yes. So he was my, he was a very, very close friend of mine. And my first experience to the black counter tenor voice, yeah. which is a yeah. different, I mean, we're going we gonna to call the thing a thing. It is, okay. Different sound you know yeah so please talk please talk a little bit about that as much as you want about that oh gosh i think you know here's where i could get in trouble but you know what we're going to just be honest because yeah. i think that that's the best thing especially for for those um uh, counter tenors who have come before me and those who are coming alongside with me and those who are coming after mm -hmm. um i as i said earlier i'm proud to be black there's never a day that goes by that I'm not proud to wake up in the skin that I'm in uh, and celebrate who I am and what I bring to society and what my ancestors and those who have been um, the standard bearer 
what they had bought before me. Like, uh, Derek Ray, Lee Reagan. Right, exactly. Okay, Derek Lee Reagan is, he is the hallmark, in my mind, mm -hmm. of the counter tenor voice, period. Black, white, I don't care. He is the hallmark. I just think he's fantastic. Yeah. And I hope uh, in my life that I will make as much of an impact as he has uh, made on me. But as an African-American male singing in this art form, there are challenges that arise. I don't necessarily always know what they are because I'm not always in the room. You know, you're not always in the room when discussions are being made, which is fine. Yes. Um, but I will say, I think that um, most of the time, especially, I can't say especially here, but I know even in Europe, like in Europe, I am not the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. You right. know, I am not, I, I don't look, and in, in some places here, mm -hmm. I am not the aesthetic to be in a heroic role, not because of my weight, not because of anything, just because I'm an African-American. Yes. Um, you know, I'm not this thin, I, I shouldn't say that, but I'm not, I'm not the aesthetic. Right. Um, and there are people who are championing bringing people of color, black people, into the sphere even more in terms of their programming and things like that mm -hmm. at large opera houses. And what I will say is that there's not a role, and I, I may regret this at some point, I'll knock on my piano, but there's not a role that you could present to me that I could not sing if you presented it to me. Um, and I think that there have been in the past and maybe still today, I don't, like I said, I'm not in the room, so I don't know what the reasons are. So a lot of this is, I will honestly say, based on conjecture, because I don't know right. what, what those conversations are. But I think that sometimes it can be a little difficult to imagine, you know, uh, a black counter singing a certain role. I don't know why. Uh, I, I cannot tell you why it would be difficult, because I don't think it's difficult. I've done mm -hmm. Julius Caesar. I've sung Tolomeo. I've mm -hmm. sung, you know, I could sing Sesto. Yeah. You know, wow. Um, wow. could sing Cherubino uh, and maybe getting a chance to do that soon. Ooh, uh, okay. You know, uh, could do Sesto and La Clemenza. Uh -huh. But these yeah. are these are things that are not done often, you know, with any kind of tenor, whether they're black, white, mm -hmm. Asian, whatever. Absolutely. Um, but I definitely think that there are hurdles um, that are out there. And, and when you think about it, I mean, and we think about all the other Fox, F-A-C-H, where there are other African Americans in it, and there is still uh, a journey to be had. Mm -hmm. If you think about it in the counter turn of voice, really, there are not that many of us out singing a whole bunch. Right. So you can think about how little—I mean, not little progress. So there's progress that's been made in the in that uh, in that realm in terms of African American counter tenors, but more of us could be singing on the stage. More of us could be singing at big opera companies. Yes, they're all killer. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There are so many. Mm -hmm. So many. I know I'm friends with everybody, you know. Um, and you know, one of the things I mean there has been moments in my life where I have gotten discouraged and thought, well maybe I should just quit singing and just stick to teaching and do mm -hmm. that because I love that as well. But mm -hmm. the, the one thing I know for sure is that I have a voice and I know that God is utilizing it for for him and that it's utilized for good and I will not stop. Mm -hmm. singing and doing what I'm doing until I see people at the same table as me yes. who look like me, those who, who look like people from my neighborhood. I will not stop singing and I will not stop advocating for countertenors of color. And I do mean countertenors of color, not just black countertenors mm -hmm. uh, at the table. Yes. And I'm a person that I don't ask for people to say thank you or anything like that. All I ask for for anybody that comes to the table is to be yourself, unapologetically, mm -hmm. to show up 200% prepared and to be there to do the work and just be who you are and do the thing. Do, do it and do it well. Yes, exactly. That's all I want. That's it. That's it. And you know what? When you do that and things still don't pan out, you have you can rest on the fact that you did everything. You checked all your boxes. Yes. And everything yeah. else, you know, it's not in your hands. You have to, you know, I always wish that someone would have said, Karen, just focus on the things that you can control. Early when I started my career, 
just mm-hmm. focus on the things you can control. You can control what you look like. You can control yeah. what you sound like. You can yeah. control, you know, how much you practice and how prepared you are for certain things. Those yeah. are the things that, sh- that are the most important. Not what people think about you. No. You know, no people's opinions. Like those things don't matter. And we waste so much time focusing on, oh my God, does this person like me? Is this person going to want, you know, mm-hmm. want to sign me? Is this person going to give me an opportunity? And it's just wasted yeah. energy. Yeah, because you can't control it. It's just like you said, you can't control what other people think and, you know, what other people think of you is not your business. Exactly. I mean, I don't even, I do not read reviews. I got caught up, I'll tell you a story about this. I used to read reviews and I remember, I can't remember the day that I was in grad school at CCM and I was so excited to sing something because I was going to finally be reviewed. I was like, oh, I said, Professor Likes, I'm going to finally get a review. And she was like, you don't sing for a review, baby. Like, like you don't do that. Like, mm-hmm. you just sing because you love to sing. And all the reviews will come. Yes. And then I had a teacher at Juilliard, Eve. Um, oh, God. What's Eve? What? Eve Shapiro. And Eve told me, I, I was doing Rodamisto. I'd sung the mm-hmm. title role at Juilliard. And in, in between doing that, my father had had an accident. So I was going back and forth between New York and Houston probably every other weekend or every two or three weekends. But I was going down often. And um, I remember working so hard on Rodamisto with a role that was very low for me, Mm -hmm. but a role that I was enjoying. Um, And I think I sang it well. And I remember reading a review and it didn't say anything bad. Not that I remember. It didn't say anything Mm -hmm. bad. It just didn't say anything about me, period. (laughs) I thought, well, all right. Well, Well, we have those. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they don't know how hard I've worked. And then she told me, she says, you know, Johnny, she says, if you... um, if you want to believe the good ones, you must believe the bad ones. So if you don't want to believe the bad ones, you cannot believe the good ones. Right. And that kind of messed me up. And I was like, you know what? I won't I won't read them anymore because you don't want that to be the thing that is an indicator for you of how you will do your performance. You yeah. know what you're doing. You and the truth be. of the matter is every day you get on the stage, you're not going to be feeling well. You're not going to be feeling 100%. It's very rare that you feel that way. But get on the stage and be better than you were the day before or the time yes. before. Even if you are sick and you can still phone it, get out there and do your best. And if you can't sing, don't sing. Don't sing. But mm. get out there and try your best. And, uh, you know, my aunt would always say, try your best and let God do the rest. Yes, yes. Big mama <laughs> always says, nothing beats a failure but a try. But a so try. get out there and try. And try. And uh, all the other stuff is water under the bridge. Mm-hmm. Those reviews will, uh, in in my mind, the, the, that's their job. Mm-hmm. Their job is that's what puts food on their table. So mm-hmm. respect them for what they say, whether you like it or not. And if you don't like what they say, just don't read it. I don't read anything. Yeah. I, I say I don't. And sometimes I don't. But then I, I sneak in, you know, read. And then I'm like, oh, my God. you know, then I'm freaked out. But what's the difference between the business of singing and the art of singing to you? Ooh, the business. Of tell singing. the people. Mm. Tell the people because there is there is a the business of singing and there is yeah. the art of singing and I you know mm-hmm. the business of singing is what I was doing today like having a meeting about strategy and strategizing and and trying to figure out you know um, I had on a shirt which is my Opera Philadelphia shirt mm-hmm. and it, and it certain things will spur things in my mind yes uh, my best friend Nikai he, you couldn't see all of the words. You could only see the top, uh-huh. right, of the, of, the, of the text. And my best friend says, oh, that's an Opera Philadelphia shirt, isn't it? I said, yeah. And I was like, how do you? He said, I don't even have to see all the words to know that that's their brand. I can see it from like a mile away just by looking at a little bit. That's how strong branding is. Mm. And it immediately made me think, what is my brand and how can you see it from a mile away? Right. And so I started to think about... Um, the strategizing of what singing is, the strategizing of what my brand is, um, who who I am. But I can honestly say, like what you see, what what you see with me on the stage, and what you see of me in recitals and in real life, like even right now, is what you get. Like this is who this is who I am. Mm-hmm. So it's trying to put like a, a name to that, or like trying to put a strategy to it. I don't know what that is. But I've also realized that in in some ways, well, not in some ways, but in all ways, it's good to be an expert in some things 
And it's okay to be really dumb in some things too and let somebody else know how to do other things. Mm -hmm. So my job, I feel like, is to do the work of getting on stage, singing, knowing my music, knowing my role, knowing the character arc, being a good human being, being a good colleague, mm -hmm. uh, you know, knowing what I'm saying. But strategizing, I don't know how to do that. So right. I can hire a friend or hire someone who's recommended to me to get on board with that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the business of singing is being like being prepared, knowing your words, knowing your music. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can be more prepared than you are in other uh, uh, other instances. I've had that happen. Um, but but being prepared, uh, having you know social media presence, I think is mm -hmm. the more and more we go along. Yeah, because we're coming up in a time where I was one of the very first people at, at my university who was on Facebook when Facebook came out in two thousand three. Right. Right. Um, but it has changed, the, the landmark of media has changed, but we now have students and, and kids, and this is no shade to them, who can't really watch more than two to three minutes of material. So now we have TikTok. So it's like trying to figure out how to navigate and move to that. Like, mm -hmm. how, can I, how can I get that audience? Because this is the audience that we need. This is our future. This is the future of patrons. This is the future of our art form. Right. The future of people who are journalists, right. artists, administrators. Yeah. So, you know, how can I get these people uh, interested? So it's kind of strategizing. And my, there are some people in the industry who they don't have any of that. And that's, you know, more power to you. I, mm -hmm. I can't do it by myself. And I'm not ashamed to not be an expert in it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be an expert in everything. Mm -hmm. I'm really only an expert in John Holiday. <laughs> um, and then, that's like, already enough the holiday. Okay, life. That's a lot. Uh, <laughs> And yes. The, the excellence, yeah. the, the, the art of music, of artistry, you know, I, do, I almost don't even know how, how to explain it because in my mind, it is the art of just being, being. the art of being. I, I love um, the fact that when I get a good piece, piece of music or something that's brand new or even something that's old, and I'm doing that thing and just kind of sitting in it and letting it be and becoming one with it. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing that what I'm singing, I love you guys are gonna hear me talk a lot about Maya Angelou, Oprah, all these people, because these are like gurus to me. Maya Angelou says that words are things, right? You can yes. fling them and make them the words stick on the wall. And so what I know is like the words that come out of my mouth, even in this, this space, which is my sacred space, they stay on the wall and it, informs me as an artist. My experience, my lived experience informs me as an artist. So bringing all of me to the table, whether the administrators want it or not, mm -hmm. bringing all of me to the table, that to me is artistry. The music is there, the music lives in me. If I open up my mouth, what I think is you open up your mouth and you exhale with feeling. And one of the things that is so amazing to me that I'm so grateful for is that God made an animal, a mammal, whose exhale can sound like music. I'm so grateful for that. Oh. So grateful for that. Yes. Oh, John, that is, you gave us, <laughs> that's a whole expression. I, I never imagined that answer when I, <laughs> When I thought of that question, I've never been asked that before. So that's what that's what I. Feel. I think that it's important to ask that question because it gets it gets um, the gray area. It gets misconstrued, and depending on who the person is teaching us the difference between the two and what's expected, you know, it's like yeah. some one outweighs the other. Oftentimes with people, yeah. but I think we have to get back to. The singing, I mean, that would change the way I sang. If you were my teacher yeah. and you said you need to breathe in, you know, the text and all these, I mean, it would, it would completely change the way you train people how to sing. And I think oh, you're totally. a teacher, you know? Yeah. This is what I tell my students. And for, and for me, uh, well, see, sometimes I get emotional when I start talking about it. But um, when I sing, it's when I feel closest to God for me. It's when I feel closest to all. Yes. You know, to all. And um, and when I feel so in love and when I feel so young and when I feel adventurous. And that's what artistry is as well. It's the art of taking chances yes. on yourself. On yourself. That you can't be wrong. You're not going to be wrong. And, and, and guess what? 
it's okay to be wrong. I used to beat myself up about missing three or four notes out of an entire opera. And I, I started doing life coaching. Uh, I'm not a life coach. I see a life coach mm -hmm, mm -hmm. years ago. And she was telling me how many pages is in this score. Oh, I was like, probably like 300, 400 pages. And she was like, you missed five notes and you're beating yourself up. She said, that's less than 0, 0.0, you know, or, you know, percent of the opera. Mm -hmm. And that totally changed my mindset about, I am a perfectionist. I don't think that'll ever leave me, yes. but it changed my mindset about, about performance because I thought if I can just be in it mm -hmm. and rather rather than harp on that five mistakes that I made, mm -hmm. I'll enjoy my life more. Yes. You know, because this is a part of who I am. Mm -hmm. I am, I always tell people I'm not just a singer, but I am music. Mm -hmm. I am not just a friend. I am friendship. Mm -hmm. I am not just a brother. I, I am love. I am family. I am all of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I'm being an artist, I I, I hope that I exhibit all of those things. That's why I, I fell in love with you. Students. That's why I fell in love with you when I heard when I heard you sing. I I didn't know that that's what I was listening to, but I got all of that, and I was like, okay, he's my boyfriend in my head. Like, come on, now. <laughs> come on, girl, oh, come on, boyfriend. No, on, I <laughs> I got all of that. I was like, that's the artist. That's the kind of artist that I res respond to. Like, that is just something that is just. Yeah, you're my kind of people. You're my well, you know, the thing is, too, when I think about it, is that I, I love you, by the way. I just, I'm so thankful for this platform that you have done. And I, I know I texted you last week and I said this, and I'm saying it publicly, is that I'm so proud of you for doing your thing, for doing what you are called to do, because this is a calling, and having a space where people can commune, the spirits can commune, and where, as Bill T. Jones would say, the gods into the room. Mm. This is a space where, where that can happen. This is a space where that can happen. And one of the reasons why I am the way that I am in terms of the stage is that for far too long, I have felt that other people have written our story. Mm -hmm. I, along with the help of God and the ancestors, am the author of my story. Yes. And I... When I leave this plane, I want to say I did that thing. I did that thing. Mm. I did all right. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Whew, that's why I said that they're not going to push me out. I'm going to let you know when I'm ready to go. When mm -hmm. I said all I wanted to say. And, all, and it, it may not always be on the platforms that I thought it was going to be on. Or the yeah. pages that I always ho dreamed and hoped I would be on. But it's going to be on my terms. Yeah. You know, and I, I receive that and I say that out loud, you know, that's beautiful, John. Oh, I love you. Oh, okay. So talk, so since you talked about Bill T. Jones and I did have a question because I want you to talk about, we should not be moved. I want you to talk about um, what it was like to create a role, a new role. Um, and, and I oftentimes push as many artists as I can to, to do the new works because, and to have the diversity of the opportunity to create the new work because it's it's something that's just so freeing that you don't get doing yeah. other things. But I want you to talk about what it's like to work in a situation where you're working with a legendary director where there's movement and spoken oh. word and um, opera and jazz and R&B and then the orchestra is behind you. So please tell the people Me? about that all the experience. That. Yes, Opera Philly. Yes. So tell experience. the company and all that stuff. I Opera Philadelphia has been a place for me, much like Glimmerglass Opera, that has been a uh, um, how can I say it? Uh, my sanctuary, mm -hmm. where I feel that we that I am safe. Mm -hmm. I feel that I am safe to explore. Uh, and I remember when they were bringing me on to this, thinking I was like, "Oh, I'm getting ready to create this role." And in my life, I've now this is I think uh, that was the second or third brand new no second second work that I had done mm -hmm. that was brand new. Mm -hmm. And I can remember a time in my life, and I'm not ashamed to say it, it was in my earlier years, 
where I'd be like, well, I'm not singing this and I could be singing that. Now, why am I not doing that? And why am I not doing this? And why am I not? Uh, uh. <laughs> and God has a way of showing up and saying, stop all that. I got something for you that is meant for you, oh. that you are, you were born to do, that you were created to do. And I got this, and I remember thinking, oh, it's a like jazz hybrid thing. Like, that's like right up my alley. Like, mm-hmm. well, let's do this. <laughs> um, and I remember being called in for, you know, we were doing the workshop. And the workshop happened right, I, I kid you not, it happened, the very first one happened right after the election of Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> and I remember walking into that rehearsal. I was late. I could not get to rehearsal on time because Hillary Clinton was doing her succession secession speech. Uh, I forgot how to say it. Not secession. Um, she was conceding, conceding her concession speech mm-hmm. to um, to Donald Trump. Lord, I didn't say it's secession. Concession speech <laughs> to him at the hotel across the street. So I was taken because I don't like the subway. I, I, in that way, I can be bougie sometimes. So I did not want to be on the subway. So I was taking an Uber or a Lyft. And it took me like an hour to get to the rehearsal room. And it, most people were late that day, I think. Uh-huh. Anyway, we get to rehearsal. And woo, I remember Daniel Bernard Rumain, who was the composer, who is the composer of We Should Not Be Moved, yes. was saying, this has just happened. And he's like, Bill, what do you have to say? And Bill was like, let's get to work. He's like, because it is through the work that we can make the difference. Mm-hmm. It's through being, like I was just saying, that we can make the work happen. We can't change the election. Shit, the election happened. Yes. We can't change it. All we can do is be our best selves and be who we who we want to see, the change we want to see, see in the world. Yes. Um, and so we got to work. And I'm glad to say that I was there from the very beginning of the, well, not the very beginning workshops that they had because they, they had started workshopping it, I think, like maybe a couple of months before before I got into it mm-hmm. and the part was written for me. But seeing this role where this entire opera presented a lot of different um, challenges that we, that we are facing in the United States right now, mm-hmm. where you had a character in the opera who... Um, felt that he, um, he he was a white character, but he, he identified as black. Then you had a female to male transgender character, which was me, my character, John Blue. Then you had the cop who was not white, but was white passing, and her name was Glinda. And so it's like, it gives you the idea of like Glinda the Good Witch and all those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was an opera to date for me that has been the most amazing opera that I have ever done in my life. Not because I created it or the the role, but because of what it did for the culture Mm. of what it, what it meant. I will never forget the video that you guys saw as the archival video. Um, Yes, Adam, I'm bougie. Uh, (laughs) That, that video was of the high school students in, in Philadelphia. And I'll never forget the question and answer period that we had afterward and how excited they were doing the whole show because in essence what they were what they were seeing on stage was themselves. Yes. How I would have loved to see that for myself growing up and I didn't. Mm-hmm. But it did deter me, thank God. But to see themselves portrayed on the t- uh, uh, on the stage, the good, the bad, the ugly, the in between. Um and then doing this role of John Blue Ooh, that was a process for me because what I've learned about myself as an actor on stage, I tend to be kind of like, I wouldn't say method so much, but like I'm in the role. Like mm-hmm. what you see of me on the stage, like I am in that. Yeah. And then Adam will tell the story of like how after the show, I would always have a Ricola and I'd be like chewing on the Ricola, like during the thing we're on the stage, changing the stage, but like, but for real, like I'm in the character in the moment and having, um, interviews with with people who are trans both male and female Mm -hmm. um i have a friend who Mm -hmm. is uh male to female trans Mm -hmm. she's just trans i hate even saying no she's trans she's just who she is right and and john blue is john blue and in this opera he is being bullied uh because of the transition and then he is um 
he is basically raped, or the insinuation is that he is raped by Manny. Um, and in essence, in the way I view it, in, in a way, the action that John Blue takes is one of the actions that spins the entire opera in another direction mm -hmm. when he shoots Manny, because Manny is also Glinda's brother. But we don't know that. Right. We don't know that when it's happening. Um, but this opera took me on the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. I remember crying like in the workshop when I was singing it. Mm -hmm. And like every night that I would sing it, I would sing it somewhat differently, like the, the riffs and rhymes mm -hmm. and things like that. Yes. Um, and the aria. I would, cr I would cry in that every night that I sang it. Um, and I would have to be snapped out of it by Unsung when she would say, hey, you know, let's go to this next part. Yes. Yeah. Um, but what a thrill and honor it, it is for me to have brought that to life. But what it is for me as a human being is it's God's manifestation of, I always say to my students, one of my mantras is that you can do any good thing. I can do any good thing. Mm -hmm. And God brought to me a good thing. Mm -hmm. So... Whew. He he bought to you a good thing, and you all bought to us a good thing. And anybody who knows me well knows that I love that opera. I constantly talk about that opera. I constantly talk about it to administrators. I I think that that opera is a is going to be should be a piece a part of history, a part of opera history. It should. <laughs> it should. It should. And I just be. when you guys did it in in Europe, people went crazy, right? Yeah, people went ape bleep in Europe. Like we were in Amsterdam at the Dutch National Opera. And this is a primarily uh, uh, um, uh, Caucasian and white group of, mm -hmm. of people in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And what we learned while we were there, we did learn, like I said, I don't read the reviews, but we did find out that the review was like a five-star review of the opera mm -hmm. in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Is that... The idea of failing schools, the idea of police brutality, mm -hmm. the idea of violence against black and brown bodies, mm -hmm. the, the, the idea of disparities that are systemic are inherent, they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It spoke. I'll never forget the people coming up to us and talking to us up about it after the show yeah. premiered in Amsterdam. Yes. And I think, I'm sorry, but I think it takes, it will take a person who is really courageous to program this, this should be in my, and not just because I'm in it, because one day I won't be able to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So there'll be more people that come. But it's an opera that should be done at every major opera house. It should be done in every major city. It should be done at Washington National Opera. It mm -hmm. should be done in San Francisco. And you know what? If it can't be done at San Francisco, somebody in Oakland, you guys pick it up and do it. Mm -hmm. Because everywhere that I'm naming to you, in D.C., Houston, in L.A., in, in uh, Chicago, in Detroit, in Florida, mm -hmm. I can keep on going. You have, and I think this is me as an educator, you have systemic things that are going on in terms of like failing schools. You have poverty. You have things that are going on that need to be righted, and this opera confronts it head on, and it uses language that is, I guess, for some people hard to say. I, I say words in it that I would normally never say, mm -hmm. but it is an opera that brings this to the fore, and I think it's so important. Not only is it beautiful, but it's poignant. Yes, it, it takes you to it takes you on a journey of love, heartache, despair. And then putting it back together again, and hope, and and hopefulness, um, and praying, and and I mean, the ugliness that exists mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. racism that exists in the world. I could go on, on. I love, I love this opera, and I love that it's black. <laughs> Tell the truth, <laughs> yeah, okay. John and every. I love that John, as we say in Philly. <laughs> okay, come on, John. Come on, John. <laughs> come on, I know about it. I know yes. about it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. I mean, I, yeah, I, like I said, I always, I think, and, and, and you're, we're going to need pieces like we shall not be moved when things open up. We're going to be so yes. thankful for, for pieces like Blue and Fire 
and we should not be moved in Central Park and all of these things. This, first of all, those going to bring people to the theater. Second right. of all, these are impactful, relevant stories, and these are transform transformational, healing stories with yes. music that people can relate to. And they show up. We show up. Yes, we do. You yes, I mean, our show was sold out every time. Yeah. How about that? As Wendy would say, how you doing? How you doing? Right. Listen, y'all could have done another run, another whole run of performances because so many people were like, I'm, oh my God, I didn't know about it. Or, yeah. you know, I wish I could have seen it. I mean, people were telling right. me like, you know, that like my, my, my husband was saying, I wish that my brother and his friends and like our family could have could have um been able to see it because he saw it and he was he just talked about it for weeks you know uh, go to a lot of opera and so for him to like react the way he did i really really it, it really could have done but since we're like talking about that let's talk about present day present day events and activism and what it means to be an artist and a classical artist in this time period with all of the things that are going on because it's different. We can't just go out to the front lines and, you no. know, and start out mm -hmm. with an aria. Like it's not, no. it's not the same thing, you know? No. Um, you know, this is something that I take very seriously, just like in my, in my work and in my, in my doing and in my being, I don't, I don't have a, I mean, I do have a platform. It's not, I don't have like, million followers or anything like that but i do have followers and so what i what i try to do sometimes i can be a little delayed in my in my response or saying something because sometimes I, i'm having a hard time mm -hmm. and i'll tell people when i say like it's because i i'm having a hard time trying to figure out what to say because sometimes as as full, filled with light and as warm as i can be sometimes you just feel like cussing somebody out and so you feel like okay let me not let me not say anything right now mm -hmm until I can gather my thoughts where they are coherent mm -hmm. uh, or cogent thoughts for people to, to take in. You know, that they, they can take these thoughts in and they can digest them, synthesize them and all that. Yeah. But uh, for me, it is important that I, when I'm doing a recital, that I'm doing works by African-American composers, uh, Aisha Lizzie Adams, Margaret Bonds, Florence Price, I could go on, uh, mm -hmm. Evelyn Corrin, Simpson, I mean, Simpson Corrin, you know, uh, these, these people. Um, and I try to make sure that I'm doing work by, by, um, women composers, mm -hmm. uh, African-American poets, mm -hmm. um, and doing that in my recital. Cause sometimes people don't know about these. I mean, I shouldn't even say that cause I know it's not a shock to you, right. but sometimes people don't even know about these composers mm -hmm. and I'm like, you need to know these people. You need to know these spirituals. These are spirituals or the, not even spirituals for, for instance, just like these works that are by these composers are just as good as leader, just yeah. as good as chanson, you know, yeah. it is, it is beautiful music. And so, um, I take great pride in bringing that to the forefront in my recital. I do not do a recital where there is not an African-American or African-American composers on my recital. I will not do it. I will not. Yes. Um, and I don't use it as a showstopper, but I will say this, that anytime you program an African-American composer and, you, and you're doing it the way you should be doing it, mm -hmm. it's going to be a showstopper, <laughs> whether it's at the beginning or at the end. Yeah. So I will say that. Yeah. Um, yes, Camille. Facts. Hashtag yeah. facts. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so I will do a recital with that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to bring, like I said, to bring yourself and to bring your heartache, to bring your, to bring your dissatisfaction, to bring mm -hmm. your anger, to bring your hopefulness, to bring your exhaustion mm -hmm. to to the table. To be real, mm -hmm. to have those feelings, and to do it unapologetically, and to and to not be ashamed of yourself for being tired mm -hmm. and being exhausted. Yes, I, I haven't told many people this except for like people that are dear, dear friends of mine. But there was an award show where <clears throat> where Jill Scott was singing "Strange Fruit," and I was like, I love this song mm -hmm. so much, uh, and I love, of course, Nina Simone and Billie Holiday singing mm -hmm. it. But I thought. I am going to sing this in my show. 
And I remember the very first time I, I sang it, I remember telling Kevin, I was like, people are going to like be so upset with me for doing this, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> uh, and I've done it, and it's become one of the things that like I now have to sing on my mm-hmm. on my shows. But I I am unapologetic. I know that it may seem it. it I don't know because that's one thing I have to get I have to get uh, out of my mind. Sometimes I'll say I know something I don't know. It, it could, from the outside, look like um, there are many of us who who are not uh, as outspoken. Mm-hmm. I am outspoken. I, I use my platform. I use my recitals on. There's not a single recital where I don't speak the way I'm speaking right now in that recital. You can mm. ask anybody who's been there. I will speak to you my mind, whether it's in, in Europe, mm. whether it's in uh, at the Apollo, whether it's at um, uh, in Los Angeles or Beverly Hills, you know, mm. at the Annenberg, wherever it is, you're going to hear from me about how I feel and how, how my life is as an African-American man. I am a black gay man who also happens to be a Christian as well. So I know all too well the, uh, the circumstances uh, that, could, that could welcome themselves upon my body at any moment mm. for being black, for being gay, for being out and proud. You know, I, it does not go with, it doesn't go, um, it's not lost on me. And I also know that it is not lost on me that I have a privilege as well, too, now that I am a person who has made some money in my life. I'm not by any means rich, but I have I have made a certain uh, life for myself. Mm-hmm. So I recognize that there are privileges that I, is that I have, but it don't stop me from being black. And I can get pulled over just like everybody else. Mm-hmm. I have got, because I speed, I ain't gonna lie, I speed in my car. I tend to get let go, but it doesn't <laughs> stop me from being in an elevator and some person, some woman clenching her purse and me thinking, so are you serious woman? You know, like I could buy your whole bag if I, if I wanted to, you know, and the contents if I wanted to, Right. you know, having that, that's the, that's what I think in my mind, you know, that's mm-hmm. like, that's, of that's what happens. And I know what happens to so many of us. Like you get onto the, the elevator and you think that, and it's not a, a egotistical thing. It's just like a really like, you're going to clench your bag when I get on the elevator. I've had people go the opposite direction of me when I'm walking on the sidewalk. And I'm, I think I'm a really nice person. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have my days too when I can be mean or mm-hmm. not mean, but like when I'm not having a good day. Right. But right. You know, generally, I'm a, I think I'm a good guy. Of course, yeah. uh, but I, right now, I'm having a hard time just like everybody else. I have been so hurt uh, and exhausted by the things that have happened to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor mm-hmm. and Ahmaud Aubrey and Ayanna Iyan- Dior, who is yeah. a... Uh, trans woman a black trans got attacked woman. yesterday in in Minneapolis, and mm-hmm. it it floors me because just as loud as we are about George Floyd, we should be about Ayanna Dior. We should be just as loud, and we are. I'm seeing it now about Brianna, and I will tell you, and I, I I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna catch flag for it, and I I'm not sorry about it. Long before I was ever called an N word. I was called a faggot by my community. So when it comes to these issues of being black and gay, I want people to know that our lives matter too, that I'm just as important. Yes, I'm black, yes, I am gay. And you should love me just like you love your sister or your brother. And you don't have to agree with what I do or who I sleep with or what I do in my own spare time because you don't have to come into my bedroom but you should love me because simply I was born Mm. and I am worthy of being loved. I am worthy of having a voice. I am worthy of being safe. And I want for all of us to just digest that. I don't, I, I, I was gonna say I understand, but I don't understand. I want you to just see me. When you see me, whether I'm gay or short, fat, tall, short, you know, my finger might do like, whatever it is, I'm black and I have, and not even that I'm black, that I'm a human being and that my life matters. I am black, I am gay, I am a Christian man and my life matters and I want it to matter just as much as my heterosexual men's lives matter. And like I said, I know I'm gonna catch flag for that, but I don't care. Mm because that's the truth. And until we confront that, and that we confront that black trans lives matter, you know, 
we're gonna we're gonna continue to go up again because when why does that life not matter? You know? Yes. So I'm 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 in it. Sorry, well, y'all. This, you know, no, let's don't be a ap- don't don't uh, be apologetic about it. Listen, this is what this platform is for. This platform is not for, you know, likes and shares and amounts of people watching whatever because people watch this show and this show is yeah. affecting, but this is for my my people that I admire, people that I love and people who some are my friends to come on and let other people see you, really see you, not see yeah. you. Yeah, but see me. you, you know what I mean? That's why I don't have music and singing and, you know, all of those things. And people can go to YouTube and, and find those things. Find all that. Yeah, this is for artists to, to be in this space and to be open and share. So, yeah, whew, you have blessed me so much. There's been so many times where I just wanted to, like, you know, listen. <laughs> I'm telling you because intersectionality is a thing. Like, yeah. intersectionality is a thing. And we, I'm not saying that that's the most important thing, but there are intersectionalities that exist within this whole realm of, of being. Yes. And until we can, until we can, can uh, understand that we're gonna, I hate to say it, but if this kind of thing, violence mm-hmm. against bodies, is gonna keep, especially black bodies, is gonna keep on being a thing until we can all recognize that 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 we are all human beings. Yes. And that love is love and that I'm just a human being trying to love someone mm-hmm. and trying to be loved. That's it. Oh. You know? Mm-hmm. And they and that's the worst thing is when people go through life and not feel love. Yes. And, and not I want love. I want to be I'm just saying I just want to be loved. Mm-hmm. Look, just want to be loved. Exactly. And that's why oftentimes I feel like the people who may have hurt me in my in my life or said hurtful things and or done, you know, they, it's because they just want to be seen. Yeah. And they want your attention and they want you to give that energy. And sometimes it's not about you, you yeah. know, but it also is the other person crying out for love and wanting to be that. We all want to be loved. We all, I mean, like, uh, I think that's the one thing about not being a, being able to be on the stage not only yeah. are you not being able to express yourself, but you're not be able to give to give love or receive it. And people yeah. are really struggling with that. They really, really are struggling with yeah. people not being able to sing together. Jake sent me this beautiful um, video of people singing. They didn't have any masks on. They didn't have any, but people are aching to be together and, and, and making music and being able to touch each other and, yes, and connectedness. connectedness. That's a thing. And I want this space That's to be thing. about that, you know? For oh, it is? Connect. Aaron, it is. I can feel it when I'm watching you, these videos. Really, that's why. That's literally why, why I sent that message to you last week. I mean, I I feel that when I see that and I, and I, and I don't, I was gonna say I pray, but I don't need to pray because I know that it's gonna happen. Power and death lie in the tongue. So what I know for sure is that it's gonna continue to be mm-hmm. that kind of space because that's what you would have it to be. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Man, oh my God, I'm so filled up. I'm so filled It's not even the wine, I'm just filled up, John Holiday. <laughs> yes. 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 Yes, I mean, that's really, I mean, I wrote down notes and I always write down notes and making sure that I'm, you know, but you, I mean, we touched on everything. I t- I want you to talk about the future and what. Okay, no, I want before we talk about the future. I want you to talk about what we can do because we're all being called um, as black artists by our bosses and people who have hired us and our friends and people in this business, you know, who who are not African American to help them to aid them and support them and to, to you know with this whole i don't even want to say transition transition it's a revolution i yeah. know what 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 advice would you give to us us is speaking mm-hmm. to our friends and what do you see the business looking like after i don't know i think this is a good question it's something that i've uh, that, I, that i need to think about on and, and as i said earlier i, I don't want Want, you know, this happens even in my family sometimes when I speak. Sometimes what I'm saying is I take it. Sometimes what I say is taken as a Bible. This is not one of those moments. But I'm just going to speak like kind of off the cuff. Mm-hmm. Is that I believe in my heart of hearts that we are going to begin to see 
more of us on the stage, mm -hmm. even more at the same time. Mm. Okay, that's what I that's what I think. More and more. Um, and I, I think that we're going to have colleagues and artists, artistic administrators reach out and general directors reach out and ask us ways that we can help uh, to bring light to these situations. And it'll be on us to do that or to not do that. Uh, because I also know that there are moments that it can begin to get a little bit taxing because we're always having to explain how to be and what to do and blah, blah, blah. But it's important for us to just show up and to not shy away from grabbing four seats or five seats at that table. Mm. Wow. Making sure that we are heard because you don't want, like as I was saying earlier, you don't want somebody else to write your story, right? The, we are the authors of our stories. Mm -hmm. And I think that we get to say, we get to have a say. And, and what those stories are. So I think that we will see more of us in, I hope, uh, in consultant positions, and not just those positions, but positions of even more uh, say-so mm -hmm. in how opera companies are run. I would love to be, I mean, I know I'm young. I'm not that young. I mean, I'm cute, but. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You're my boyfriend, yes. <laughs> look, I'm cute. But uh, look, I'm 35, but I but I would love to be a consultant with someone and say, you know, how this is how I feel or, or, or you know, these things. I would I live to do some things like that mm -hmm. uh, because um, I think more of that needs to be need to be done. Yes. And uh, so I see a lot of us taking more ta more seats at the table. Mm -hmm. I have a dear friend who I know is trying uh, and who is I, I'm speaking it into existence who is going to be an artistic administrator at a, 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 an opera company. And I know that it will lead to his or her, mm -hmm. um, yes. th their uh, progression through this industry in so many ways. And this is someone who I know is intelligent, uh, that there will be equity, that there will be moments of just being able to hear us. Because I know for sure that uh, sometimes I love it because even on my faculty here, sometimes it's important just to be quiet and listen, like mm -hmm. just listen to what we have to say. Mm -hmm. And then after you've listened, though, take what we've said and then turn it into an action. Mm -hmm. Do something. Be better. You know, my Angelo says, when you know better, you do better. Exactly. And so that's that's what I think is going to happen uh, now, because I, I don't think there's going to be a choice anymore. I don't believe there's going to be a choice for us. I believe that there is going to be moments where they know they know now. I have taken great pleasure uh, in seeing these opera companies come out with their mission statements or their statements about the uh, George Floyd thing. Mm -hmm. I have loved seeing it because I'm like, okay, now I'm going to see what you really do. Yes. What is it that you're going to really do? Are you going to be about the change? Or are you just saying this for right now? Yeah. Be about the change. Do these, do the work. That's what Ayanna Levinzan says. Do the work. Be about the work. Be about the and work. And I'm first to say, I know it's hard. It's hard for them sometimes to get their minds wrapped around it. But the work needs to be done. Yeah. And don't relegate us to these these bit roles either. No. And the operas. Stop that. Stop that. Yeah. Stop that's a that. whole other. That's a whole. Sometimes that's the only way in. And I get that. I'm, I understand that I have my fair share and we'll do will do a role like that coming up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's the only way in and I I recognize that. But don't just relegate us to these big roles. You know, give us give us a chance. The worst thing that can happen is that we'll fail. Or that we won't be the person that you like. And guess what? It's okay. If you don't like us, don't hire us again. Mm -hmm. I'll be the first to say it. Don't hire us again. But give us a chance. Give us a chance. So that's that's what I'll say. I hope that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And people are commenting. Uh, and be before we go, because we've been on an hour, almost an hour and a half, and we could talk forever. You know, you know how okay. we, how we are. And I'm just so thankful that you agreed to come on here and share with us. Anytime. Um, um, yes, I I know I know that I know that. Um, yeah. So what's the what is the future? What, what's what's the future for you, John? I know you can um, talk about your school that you teach at because you did. Yes, I am there. proud to be on the faculty. Uh, I will be an, I'm an associate professor of music at the Conservatory of Music 
at Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. I am from Houston and didn't know what Wisconsin really was on the map. <laughs> but I will tell you that I love it here. I love my colleagues. I love my students. I love the students. They are all mine, whether they're in my studio or not. Uh, I love being here and being able to, to mentor them and uh, share my light with them because that's what we all want to do in the world is share our light, not our oh. darkness. Um, uh, share a light with them. Uh, but I love being here, so I'm going to continue teaching here because I started teaching because I feel like there is a stigma attached to singers who teach but not directors or conductors who teach. Right. And I was like, I'm going to dispel, I'm going to dispel that myth. I'm going to teach and I'm going to sing at the big houses, yes. you know, I hope. Yeah. Um, no. so, so I am going to be continue to teach here uh, if the Lord says the same thing and we open uh, next season, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be making a debut. I guess I can say it, but I can't say the I I can't, can't say the opera. Say the house. House. <laughs> but I'm making next year, we'll see me make my debut at Utah Opera. Mm -hmm. I'll make debuts at the Metropolitan Opera, mm -hmm. singing the role of Nirreno and Julio Cesare. And then I will go from there to another company. I just signed a contract today. Oh, crap. Uh, yeah. They still got uh, this. This has no I was to uh -huh. a debut. This is only oh God. I was supposed to be making a debut next season, 20, uh, 21, 22. Uh -huh. But I'm now being brought up to 21, tw oh, wait, 2021 20, 20, mm -hmm. um, to do that. So I can't see that yet because that's yeah. not announced yet. Oh, but okay. I did sign that contract today. Yes. Uh, yes. It'll be my first Mozart my first Mozart Ooh, opera. Um, okay. And then I'll be going on, uh, also singing at a summer festival, which is brand, uh, not a brand new summer festival, but it'll be a debut for me. So I'm making four debuts next season. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, after that, you're gonna continue to see me. I am working on a CD and it is gonna be completely different. I am not just doing opera on this CD because that's not all that I am. There's uh -huh. many facets to me. So I'll be, I'm working on that right now. Uh, I've got some things that are going to be original, some covers, and some classical things that'll be on there. Or maybe it'll all be brand new. We have uh -oh. yes. And we have time. We have time at this point. You know what? I'm. You know what? And I do believe in a way, in God's weird way of being, His way of just doing things. I do believe that this moment in time is meant for us to slow down and take stock of the things that we could do. Yes. So I am utilizing the time. Uh, constructively uh, and not being destructive. You know what I'm saying? Yes, you could be destructive, but taking taking all the information, taking all the time and constructing something, building something up. Yes. So I'm working on that and that will either be released in the fall or early next year. I have been putting it off mm -hmm. for a long time and I kept on saying, oh, I'm doing something and I was working on something and then fear would stop me mm -hmm. um, from doing it because I want I want my music to speak. I want it to mean something. And I thought, you know what? If it means something to one person other than me, I've done my job. Yes. And so I am working on that. And when it comes out, I hope that you all will, will get it. I don't know what the title will be yet, but just stay tuned and keep on praying for me because I am a, a work in progress, just like many of you. Uh, and I don't believe in having arrived. There's, I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. I believe that this is a journey. I'm, I am on the journey, and as I would tell anybody, to God, to God be the glory. That's who gets all the glory. Mm -hmm. And I am, am thankful for it. Uh, so just pray for me and keep me in your thoughts and your mind and your, in your, your daily um, everything. Yeah. Just, just think of me when you can. Yeah. And, uh, and I will do the same same thing for you. And I will also say this to you before I go. Like I said, I talk a lot. So <laughs> uh, that it does not go without, it doesn't go unnoticed that you do pray for me, that you do support me. And it is because of you and your prayers and your your support and encouragement that I'm able to, to stand on the stage and to give you all of me. Mm -hmm. So I thank you for believing in me. Because when I sing, what I what I say is that I hope that when I sing, what what when I sing, I hope that that's what heaven feels like because that's mm -hmm. what it feels like to me. So I hope that I can bring a little bit of that to you guys on the stage. So thank you for doing that for me. John Holiday Live. <laughs> you know I love you. <laughs> you know you know I love you. I love 
love you too. And I just thank all you guys for coming today and listening to us. And please share this video. Um, some of y'all come back every week, and I am I'm just I'm just thankful. I'm thankful for, for all of this. I love you, John. I love you. I love, I love you, you too. I love you too. Yes, and we just gonna leave it like that. Come on now. Come on now. Uh. I'll talk love. to you soon. Look, we cross hands. Everybody say love. Love. You love yourself. How in the hell are you going to love somebody else? <laughs> get an amen in here. Hey. <laughs> you want to go? Yes. Mwah, mwah. Right. Bye, sweetheart. Bye. Bye.